Dr. Walsh, good afternoon. Welcome to Azerbaijan. And my pleasure to be here. I always enjoy coming to Baku. Well, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome you here in Azerbaijan and also to interview you on behalf of Calibre. I would like to start with your recent book, which has been published. Uh, and uh, many people who had the good fortune of reading it uh, have told me that uh, you know, it's a very serious work of, work of scholarship. I've read the snatches of it. I'm looking forward to examining this book in its full entirety. In terms of this book, uh, I know that it was completed some time ago. So what has changed in terms of the geopolitics of the region between the time you've completed it and now? Yeah, it's a very interesting question that actually, and I have deliberated about that myself. Um, the book, it was largely a product of being written um, uh, during the war itself. It was a commentary. It was meant to uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, combat uh, disinformation that was appearing in the West, particularly from the Armenian side, uh, which were Western journalists were all too ready to, uh, to accept. Uh, but then uh, it was obviously written then in, the, in, the, in the six months or so after the war to bring it into the status of a book with more research and to look around at other aspects. Uh, it was completed, you're right, it was completed roughly I think a year ago uh, and uh, in fact uh, you know around about the end of, uh, of last year. Now the, the major thing I think that's changed is obviously the Ukraine war and the events uh, related to that uh, which has sort of put the in, Put, uh, has introduced an element of flux into the situation because I think at the time of the signing of the trilateral agreement, it was pretty clear uh, what you know who was in charge of the process, which was essentially Russia. Uh, they had managed to uh, grab hold of the process from from the OSCE uh, Minsk group. Uh, Russia had obviously asserted itself and been the, the sort of guarantor of the settlement. Now, um, since February, uh, there's been a little bit of a question mark about what the, uh, what the future of Russia will be after the Ukraine war is finished, uh, what the leadership will be like in Russia, uh, and various other aspects about the geopolitical situation of the South Caucasus. I think, you know, um, the Western powers have, uh, have, have moved a little bit to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, uh, sort of bring the western tide back into the South Caucasus. We can see that in initiatives by the EU and by, by Washington. It's, they're, not, uh, they're not really substantial yet, but uh, so obviously this is to do with the geopolitical situation arising from the Ukraine war. And that is the major thing which has brought uncertainty into the landscape. The landscape has changed a little and people are not quite sure. And this affects everybody, all the actors. It affects Yerevan, I think, in particular. Uh, they are not, not quite sure what the landscape's going to be, so they are trying to hedge their bets. And I think this has introduced the uncertainty into the, the system that was not there about a year ago. I would like to move on to the recent meeting which took place in Sochi on the 31st of October. It was uh, the meeting of Azerbaijani president and Armenian prime minister, mediated by the Russian president, have you discerned or detected any sign of tangible progress? Well, the, the statement itself and what I've read in the press uh, tends to suggest this was a sort of holding operation that wasn't so much that anything had gone backwards. There was still some momentum in the system, but nothing looked like it had changed. I think possibly, as some people have commented, the major uh, importance of it has been the, the things that are omitted from the statement, the, the elements of uh, uh, Pashinyan wanting uh, a reference to a future status or future negotiations on status not being in the statement, and also uh, certain uh, territorial uh, gains that Azerbaijan has made, uh, which uh, Pashinyan wanted the Russians to reverse. Um, uh, I think that uh, that also is not in the statement. So possibly the most significant thing about the statement is what is not in it, not actually in the statement. And uh, that would have disappointed Ar uh, Armenia. As far as I think Azerbaijan's position is, you know, uh, the president uh, made it clear that the, the issue had been settled in uh, November 2020. And uh, essentially, you know, uh, you know, Azerbaijani sovereignty was not on the agenda. Uh, the, the sovereignty uh, of, of, of Karabakh and essentially this was about improving relations between the, the countries and moving forward to a, to a full peace settlement and nothing else. There was no going back to issues that had been already uh, settled. 
Um, in that declaration, there was a clause about Russian peacekeepers mm -hmm. and that uh, the, their activities were positively evaluated. Uh, in your judgment, how committed is Russia to the idea of maintaining its military footprint in the region beyond 2025? Oh, that, that's a really tricky question, to be honest. And I think, you know, even in the book, I've, I've sort of like uh, tried to uh, examine that issue. Um, I think Karabakh it's, itself, I don't think the Russians have any great uh, strategic desire for. Um, but in the region, it's, in a wider region, of course, that's another question. I think um, they do men want to maintain, uh, you know, like a sphere of influence, obviously, which they've traditionally seen it as their sphere of influence since the time of the Tsars, uh, for about, uh, you know, since the 1820s anyway. So, um, yes, I mean, that's their objective uh, uh, in the region. Um, it, pos it possibly has two sides to it. This objective, it has a, a, positive, uh, a positive side, i.e. That, that Russia wants to, you know, assert its, its power in the region, and also a sort of negative side that they do, don't want other powers asserting their influence in the region, like, for instance, the EU, but particularly uh, um, Washington. So I think there's two elements to that, and I think maybe it, it would be a good idea to, to make a distinction there, because uh, fundamentally, uh, I think the, the, problem, the problem that all powers have in relation to the Russian sphere of influence is being able to be a good neighbour of Russia, but not being um, under the heel of Russia, so to speak. So I think, you know, if we look at the different powers in the, in the region, we see that there's a great contrast. Uh, we see Georgia having suffered a defeat in the 2008 war. We see Armenia, which obviously are almost like a dependency of Moscow. Um, and we also see some of the Central Asian uh, republics that have the same sort of problem. But Azerbaijan has negotiated that, uh, that tricky um, that tricky journey or path very, very much better than anybody else. It's, it's maintained good relations with Russia, been a, a, a good neighbour, uh, but also has, has, has asserted its independence. I think, I, I, you know, there's certain instance in the war I've brought out where that has occurred. Uh, but, and I think that's what Azerbaijan wants to do, essentially, because it doesn't want to become uh, like an, an, an enemy or seen as a threat to Russia, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's very jealous of its independence, of course. So that's, that's essentially the, the issue. But, but what is the Russian um, objectives? They're a little unclear, and they're also being thrown into a bit of flux themselves by the war in, in, in Ukraine. Um, I think that they ultimately will want some sort of guarantee uh, of uh, a Russian influence in the, in the region from parties, but we all know they play people off against each other and uh, you know, they, it's often a carrot and stick approach uh, that they, they have. So I don't, Russia's not going to go away, uh, so it has to be dealt with as a reality, that's what I would say. And one more question about Russian peacekeepers, because before the Sochi meeting, uh, President Putin was giving a speech uh, at the World Day Discussion Club, and he effectively, from what he said, it can be inferred that he tied up the future withdrawal of Russian peacekeepers from the region to the final peace deal and the, the process of uh, delimitation and demarcation of the state border. Mm. And it seems that Putin is not in favour of quick peace deal. He believes that all of those issues falling under the rubric of interstate normalization are to be pursued first and then possibly a future peace deal. Do you think that with this uh, element of procrastination, a Russian peacekeeping contingent is becoming a, some sort of a malignant alien inside Azerbaijan? Well, it could be. It has that potential without a doubt. Um, I mean, the situation is, uh, it, it, is, it isn't in the, it wouldn't be in Russia's interest that, say, for instance, Armenia made immediate peace with Azerbaijan and had great relations with Turkey, you know? This wouldn't be in, in Moscow's interest at all. It would lose all influence. In fact, there is a sort of paradox in this that the only way that Armenia can really obtain a true independence, which uh, supposedly was its purpose in 1991, is by actually making uh, a just peace, an honourable peace with Azerbaijan and with improving relations with Armenia. This would frustrate all of Moscow's designs in the area, of course. 
and especially if Azerbaijan and Armenia were able to, to you know, to, to map out a, a peace agreement which they, there was general agreement to. So in, in certain ways, yes, Russia is, would not like this situation and whether it can um, impede things is another question. Uh, I think there are ways of maybe outmaneuvering the Russians in politics and in a political sphere, I think in the military sphere, it's a very difficult and, and dangerous issue. But in, in the political sphere, in relation to if a, a, a suitable peace deal could be, could be had with Yerevan and which would be of great benefit to the Armenians, aside from the old territorial aggrandizement stuff, uh, if it could be could be uh, made, I think you know uh, this would be uh, it could be used, uh, especially in conjunction with the West, as leverage against Moscow. But I think that this is the, this is the real key to the situation because there needs to be this type of peace agreement that would be almost uh, if if Russia stood against it it would be seen as a malign influence in the region. I think the game would be up for Moscow if that occurred, but that's a very difficult thing to achieve, I think. Yeah, we talked about Moscow, but there's also yeah. Brussels, of course. Yes. Uh, and there's uh, Washington. Um, so Washington and EU are cooperating, of course. Yeah. Uh, what are the fundamental differences in terms of their approaches to the peace negotiations? I mean, Moscow on one side and EU uh, Washington on the other side. Yeah, that's a, um, that's, a, that's a tricky question as well. I think, you know, obviously, uh, in a sense, it, it starts with the idea of possession. Um, uh, you know, obviously, Russia is in the box seat at the present minute, or certainly was at, in November 2020. The, cha the, 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 the situation has changed a little since then. Uh, so that's the major difference uh, where they're coming from. Uh, Washington, uh, has influence obviously through uh, diplomatic influence, through um, various other sorts of soft power politics, and the EU particularly uh, has, has such influence. Whether that can override the Russian uh, sphere of influence is another question. And obviously people are jockeying for position at the present time, and we're talking about, it's like a chessboard, a geopolitical chessboard. And I think you know, this is a particularly of concern in Yerevan, because they, they are trying to ride a number of horses at the, at the same time, uh, not quite knowing how the landscape is going to be. They're, quite, they're riding a very four peculiar horses, actually, you know, in terms of Washington, uh, France, Russia, and Iran, uh, which uh, obviously these, these horses are all going in different directions. So Pashinyan is probably thinking, which one shall I jump onto? while at the same time trying to maintain a foot or an arm in each, which is not an easy job, but it, it has led to uncertainty and obstructionism, and uh, maybe we'll get on to that later on. Um, so the, the approaches are different, obviously. You know, the Western approach is mainly soft power. Uh, it's mainly uh, offering things, although the Western approach seems to be to uh, Armenia to uh, try, uh, try to get them to accept the sovereignty of, of Azerbaijan over, over Karabakh, which I don't see as a great deal for Armenia unless, unless Pashinyan is being promised certain other elements by the West in terms of maybe financial economic help that might be very, very attractive to lure uh, Armenia away from the Russian sphere. Uh, I think people would be quite content if that uh, was the case, um, you know, because, but uh, we still have, uh, we still have the, obviously the Russian military power, which, is, which hasn't gone away despite uh, events in Ukraine and may reappear later. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is all, as I say, in a, a little bit of flux, as I've said before. Yeah, in Valdai, just a couple of days before the Sochi meeting, President Putin uh, expressed some skeptical views about the so-called Washington document, yeah, yeah. which he said that does envisage the Azerbaijani sovereignty over Karabakh, uh, and it doesn't take into account uh, the special characteristics of Karabakh as a region. Yeah. Do you think it's a sort of a message to the Armenian side that mm. the better deal can be achieved under the auspices of Moscow rather than under the auspices of Brussels? Mm. Uh, that's definitely what it's all about. I mean. I, you know, that Moscow must be aware, they are aware of the, there are divisions within Armenia, which presents itself rather like a monolith, but actually it isn't a monolith at all. There are, there are competing tendencies in it. The, the, it's pulled in different directions by its diaspora 
and their their um, their their position, which is more pro-American, but also the actual inhabitants of Yerevan tend to think historically as Russia as their protector and their last defence type of thing in a sea of uh, hostile neighbours, which we must say have become hostile neighbours because of the activities of the Armenians and their use of outside forces against their neighbours. But um, essentially, I mean, that's what Russia's playing on. It's playing on their sense of insecurity. It's, it's, uh, it's basically saying, look, you know, remember, we are the last line of defence. We sort of made you, in a sense. We, we, we put you into this place where you, you wouldn't have existed without us as a state, essentially. Um, well, in fact, uh, they, you know, they were bailed out really in 1920 by the, by the Bolsheviks and, uh, you know, the, obviously the czarist colonization before that, building up the numbers in Karabakh. So, you know, R Russia's reminding the Armenians that, uh, you know, they are in a large part the reasons for their existence and they're playing on their, uh, their, their now the insecurities after the war. And that's essentially what they're doing. That's what Putin's sending that message to them. Don't take a chance with these people that uh, in the West who may not come to help you in the event of, of, a, of a serious problem. And uh, in fact, in, they might even uh, you know, be referring to like the situation in 1919, 1920 when Britain uh, basically evacuated the area and it was left to Russia to pick up the pieces. And of course, that's a worrying thing for the Armenians. And that's what the game that Putin's playing, I think. Um, on 6th of October in Prague, the parties, Azerbaijan and Armenia, agreed about the EU civilian mission. The arrangement is that the civilian mission um, is being sent to Armenia, uh, but Azerbaijan will cooperate as long as its interests are concerned. Uh, but there was also a decision by the EU Council, the Council for Foreign Affairs, on the 17th of October, which yeah. visibly enlarged the mandate, which was not agreed upon back in Prague. Uh, what are your thoughts about this mission? Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of all the details of this, but um, uh, you know, I mean, P uh, Europe is does do peace uh, peacekeeping, you know, and it is actually quite a useful, uh, you know, it has it has useful uh, historical experience in this, especially after the, uh, you know, various other events of the 20th century. But um, I presume it is trying to get get an element of, uh, of, of influence on the ground, you know, and uh, I think it's possibly, uh, you, know, you know, moving into an area where they feel that Russia is otherwise occupied in Ukraine. Russia is, uh, you know, may find this difficult to, um, to actually oppose uh, because it seems very reasonable. Uh, and I think it's possibly, it is extending EU influence. The EU is certainly, uh, wanting to, uh, has been moving east since you know 1991 and it, it, it seems to be a continual driving force this way um, the question I always worry the thing I always worry about the EU is uh, I always worry that after actually after the events of Ukraine in 2014 where the EU essentially uh, sort of destabilized the situation and we have the famous uh, Victoria Newland's exclamation about this, and, and actually then were really left high and dry, and uh, the United States had to pick the pieces up. So what I would worry about uh, always with the EU is it hasn't got an army, it hasn't got an armed force. Uh, essentially, it could meddle, and it could produce difficulty uh, if it doesn't uh, stick to a... Uh, a, a, a more a, a purely progressive and helpful attitude, you know. So, but there's some plausible <clears throat> perception of the EU's efforts, in particular the efforts of the EU uh, Council President uh, Charles Michel. Mm. Uh, you, you mentioned about meddling, and, yeah. and there's also France, a very important yeah. member of the European Union, and there's a growing sense that France wants to hijack this process. Yeah. How dangerous it is, and how critical it's going to be. Yeah, no, no, that's true. You've got to the nub of it there, to be honest, because what is the EU? What is the EU policy? Is it France? Because if it is France, it's not a good deal for Azerbaijan. We know that the, the French have a, a biased, uh, subjective, supportive uh, uh, um, policy. Uh, and it, it would not be, if, if the EU's policy is actually France's policy, uh, well, then that's not good. That's not a balanced uh, uh, objective uh, 
policy. And, and the problem with the EU actually uh, is the fact that what we've noticed actually about the EU in the Trump presidency is that the EU actually doesn't have real leadership. Um, it doesn't really know what to do with itself if the Ameri without US leadership in the world. I think when Trump was in power and he sort of like divested himself of, of, of leadership, uh, US leadership, uh, I think the EU was actually didn't know what to do with itself. And it was, it was dying for somebody like uh, President Biden to come back and start asserting American influence again. I think that, 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 that's worrying because essentially it means that the EU doesn't have an independent uh, viewpoint. It certainly doesn't have an army. It's not a state. And essentially it can involve itself uh, irresponsibly, particularly if you have a, a country like France dominating proceedings in the South Caucasus. Um, the other, the other powers might be okay, you know, the Eastern European people will be okay. Uh, Germany also may be okay, but, uh, but France, we know they, they have a strong Armenian diaspora and they have a, uh, an interest that is not, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, run parallel to what the interest of Azerbaijan is or Turkey. And Iran, it's a very interesting subject and everybody talks about it. Uh, is writing on the wall for Iran at present? Well, I don't, th I mean, we obviously hear a lot about this in the West. Uh, I think the Western narrative is probably um, uh, false in the respect that it concentrates on certain issues that are important in the West. Um, and it uh, probably doesn't understand uh, Iranian society fully. Um, so the news we get about Iran is possibly uh, not completely dependable, but there is obviously discontent in Iran. Uh, on, on various levels, whether they be about women's rights generally, uh, about uh, issues to do with um, uh, national ethnic uh, um, discriminations, uh, lack of uh, you know, sorry, diversity permitted in the country, and, and, and uh, probably economic issues to do with sanctions and uh, a, a, a difficult sort of uh, economic uh, prospect for, for Iran. Related to the nuclear deal, of course, which hasn't doesn't show much signs of being uh, of, be, of coming back. Um, so I think there is obviously a, a high level of discontent within Iran. I don't think there's a there's a um, I don't think there's a, an existential crisis for the state. But um, and I, I don't think the West, uh, even though uh, they might wish that upon uh, the Iranian state, uh, would would believes it either. They think it's possibly a, a way of. Uh, uh, you know, of distracting Iran and preventing it, uh, exerting its influence regionally and in places it doesn't want them to exert its influence, like Syria, for instance, and, and the Gulf region. So I, I, think, I, think, I think it has serious problems, Iran. Uh, they shouldn't be underestimated, but I don't think it's at, at certainly at present be an existential uh, crisis uh, for, for the state. Iran seems to be absolutely adamant, in particular after 2020, to improve its relations with Armenia at the expense of uh, alienating mm. Azerbaijan. And Pr Prime Minister Pashinyan was in Tehran on the 1st of November. Mm. Uh, how all of these things will uh, you know, pan out? Yeah, there seems to be two sort of Irans that I see in the media a lot. You sometimes see Iran, Iran's leaders meeting Azerbaijan's leaders. And you see, uh, you know, good statements of, you know, mutual uh, benefit, uh, statements of like, uh, you know, development, regional development, et cetera, et cetera, and, 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 and working together. But then you suddenly, then you see these really hostile, uh, you know, brittle type of uh, uh, statements from other Iranian leaders, uh, which seem to be uh, are very unhelpful. And it does seem to be, I mean, the crux of the matter is that Iran has been uh, taken by surprise at Azerbaijan's victory in, in November 2020, and it has changed the, 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 the geopolitical uh, landscape in the region. They were used to dealing with uh, Azerbaijan as a sort of, um, uh, let's just say they were, the, Azerbaijan always had the Karabakh problem. Uh, they were weakened by it. There was a sense of uh, sort of, uh, a sense of uh, depression, a sense of not fully, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the state had been 
had failed to a certain extent by losing nearly 20% of its, its territory. And Iran was quite happy with this situation, I think. Uh, it doesn't really want a strong Azerbaijan for a number of reasons. Um, there is the Israel issue, but, but avoiding that for the time being, there is probably the more, the, obviously, the, the, the large number of, of ethnic Azerbaijanis that live in Iran, which are not uh, uh, certainly a, a worry. They are a worry for the Iranian state if there's ever uh, widespread problems in, in, in Iran. So uh, Iran was always happy with Azerbaijan being on the back foot, so to speak. But suddenly Azerbaijan showed it could... Uh, you know, it could reincorporate its territory. It came out of a, as a victorious power. Uh, it looked, it looks like a completely different animal than it that it had had been. So I think Iran is has 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 not adjusted to this very well. And while it does seem to adjust when there's official statements and meetings between President Aliyev and uh, you know the, the uh, Iranian leadership, uh, other times it's almost like it's its real character comes comes up, and it, it, you can see it's a, it has an annoyance at Azerbaijan's success. Uh, it's a sort of a seething annoyance that's below the surface, and I think that's that's really uh, essentially what the the problem is that our, uh, Iran has to adjust itself to this uh, changed reality in the in the region. What's the actual main reason behind the? Iranian opposition to the project called Zengazur Corridor, because in, uh, from the Iranian perspective, as long as their official statements are concerned, yeah. it does amount to the change of borders, which Iran does consider as its red line. Yes, yes. Is it really true red line for them? Uh, what is the main reason behind their opposition beyond this argumentation? I mean, I, I think I think you know we have to you know we have to recognise the reality of the situation. That is probably they they want uh, you know like transportation, uh, uh, communication corridors through Armenia for a, num a number of reasons, but um, and I think that that is a red line for them, and I think everybody is fairly aware of that. I think possibly uh, they they would be uh, concerned at Azerbaijan controlling this area. Um, this, uh, you know, the, the corridor uh, and, and preventing trade between Armenia and and, Azerbaijan, and and Iran. I think that would be, that's what their main concern is. So they, would, they want the, the Zangazor corridor to be as, uh, let's say, uh, as, 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 as having as less substance as possible. I think they'll, possi they'll probably have to come round to it, but it'll be, uh, they'll want sort of, um, uh, maybe, maybe if there's infrastructures that can actually, uh, you know, uh, have the corridor, but at the same time maintain the, the road links, or have tunnels, or have yeah. overpasses, or things like this, I think things will work out okay. But I think they're putting down a marker essentially that, you know, that uh, they, they won't uh, tolerate, or they'll be a very, very uh, aggressive against any attempt that will try to block them off from uh, Armenia. That's essentially, I think, what they're doing. Well, Iran is an important country yes. for all, all of its problems, shortcomings and yeah. deficiencies. It's still a very important country. Of course. Uh, but how do Iran's uh, time-honoured statehood traditions, diplomatic traditions, correlate with this sort of jingoistic saber-rattling and chest-beating on the border with Azerbaijan? In particular, bearing in mind that there are a huge number of Azerbaijanis, 35, 40 million Azerbaijanis living yeah. in Iran. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very unhelpful in the, in, in the entire peace process. It only, it only antagonizes uh, the situation and it, you know, it, le it would lead to a very, very uh, dangerous situation if, the, if it developed and if uh, there was a, an open hostility between Azerbaijan and Iran that involved uh, and also a, a concurrent hostility towards Turkey, which, which of course would be a nightmare for Russia if that was to, to occur. So you know, it has the seeds to, to blow up into a very, very serious conflict that would not suit anybody really anybody's interest uh, but um, well you know I think the Iranians you know since the time of the revolution they have been under if, if we look at it from their say, say from a charitable point of view for them they've been under immense pressure from the West uh, they have they've, in, they've basically developed a sort of type of siege mentality uh, they've, they've developed a very strong 
obviously uh, particular antagonism towards uh, Israel uh, and we often hear the, the talk about Zionism and etc being everywhere and of course with some with some reason because there's been you know Israeli operations in Iran and things like this and uh, so which have been uh, harmful to them so they're, they're obviously uh, quite uh, um, I don't know if I could you, you should use the word paranoid, but certainly they have a, a strong sense of paranoia towards outside influence, agents, uh, people like this. So their politics has tended to be a, uh, sort of um, perverted by this type of siege mentality in which uh, they have to, to, to uh, make sure that enemies are ever present uh, in a sense to sort of try and um, cohere people. Uh, and I think this is, this is a, a quite a normal thing. Uh, sense, but it does lead to a, a sort of a, a rather aggressive and and uh, maximalist type of uh, you know um, uh, what's it, what megaphone diplomacy. I don't know that that would may, maybe one way of putting it, but certainly you're sort of uh, shouting slogans and things which are not really the stuff of international politics. Uh, certainly in the West, but Iran is cert is certainly that uh, exhibits that type of. Um, that type of, of diplomacy uh, and it, it seems to certain events bring this out and maybe perhaps some of the issues uh, are sort of like uh, an attempt to uh, divert attention from internal wrangling and problems you know. Thank you very much Dr Walsh, uh, thank you very much indeed for your answers I'm very grateful to you, I know you'll be here for a couple of days more in Azerbaijan mm -hmm. and looking forward to our future meetings, uh, thank you very much indeed and congratulations on your book. My pleasure and always a pleasure to talk to you as well and have these interesting chats. Vice versa.